Hi, this is uh, my review and thoughts for Waterloo Campaign 1815. This is a C3i series game, Volume 2. Uh, game design is from uh, Mark Herman. The uh, counter art is a Roger B. McGowan, and the map art is from Charlie Kibler. So, first up, components. The map, uh, I absolutely love the map. The artwork is is uh, really beautifully done, um, and it was the, in all honesty and transparency, it was the um, the map art that first drew me to this game. It's just really nicely done. Uh, it was, the visual language of the map is very clear, so it's very instantly clear to see the roads, the hexes with uh, villages and settlements, um, and so forth, and uh, just a very just beautifully done um, map and it feels it has that sort of Napoleonic um, feeling uh, instantly from just from the from the map art which I absolutely adore uh, the counters equally uh, brilliantly done very um, spacious you have two sizes of counters which I'll sort of describe what they are in when I talk about the game mechanics but nicely laid out as you can see very clear again very clear language between the French, the, the Prussians, and the English, which is just slightly out of first shot there, but they're white counters. Um, and again, you'll often be flipping the counters over. Um, and again, it's very clear to me um, which side of the counter is appropriate for that point in the gameplay. Um, you will need a couple of dice. Um, I've got a, uh, a blue dice for the French and a grey dice for, for the Prussians here. Um, I've also got a white dice for when I'm rolling for the English, um, but you will need a couple of dice. Um, you get yourself a couple of player aid cards, which are great, nicely laid out. Um, so sort of the graphic design layout of the player aids and, and the rulebook, which I'll come to in a minute, um, is excellent. Um, the player aids you're going to be using, um, this one is for the turns, and um, I think on the back of this one you've got a uh, setup. Uh, the map is quite large on the setup, so actually, I can ask you, I didn't use it, I used the rule book instead. Got a very handy um, attack summary um, player raid here. To be honest with you, the combat in this game is very, very straightforward, and I only found myself using this the first couple of times, and then it was, I had it to hand, but didn't really need it too much. And again, the same is true of the different terrain types. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, it's very clear on the map which uh, terrain type is, is relevant to each uh, to each to each hex. Um, and again, once you once you've played the game a little bit, you'll have this you'll have this down. You would hardly re be referring to that. So, in terms of the rule book, and it is a separate rule book um, to the actual magazine. The rule book quality is is lovely. It's got a really nice sort of um, matte finish to the rule book. Um, paper stock. Excellent. Um, the rules are very well laid out. Very clear spacing between each section. It really adds to the readability of the rules. Um, the, dis the description of the game, or the introduction, is uh, Waterloo Campaign 1815 is a low complexity war game. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that's not true, but I'll come back to the complexity of the game uh, when we talk about the mechanics. Um, but certainly, um, the rule book very, um, very well written and edited, um, very concise. Um, no problems. I didn't really have any problems reading the rules. I'll be honest with you, um, and it's partly because it's methodically laid out. Um, and described each section. It's also partly because um, when you're actually playing the game, and there aren't many pages of rules in this game, um, you go through each phase, um, I'll call them phases, of the game. Uh, the first few are setups, and then the actual movement phase, and then um, um, the attacking phase. And you simply, every turn, you go through each one of those steps methodically and it's pretty much contained the game fundamentally in these first few pages in terms of the actual rules. So we're at page seven, um, and that's, you know, they are the rules. Um, and it is a, uh, yeah, it is a low complexity game in terms of the rule set, definitely. Um, the interesting thing with this game, 
There are two um, scenarios. So there's the Waterloo campaign from June 16 to, eight, to the 18th, 1815. And this is the one I would recommend that you play first. Um, it gives you the detailed setup, gives you the map so you can set up via the map if you want. I just use the setup here and double checked a few times on the map to make sure I was getting it right. Um, but it gives you the setup um, and any specific rules um, to the uh, to that particular scenario. So for example on this one um, because of the weather, because of the rain, then um, the artillery uh, ricochet is, is less effective. So a nice little bit of chrome I thought to um, to this uh, to this historical period. So yeah, that was great. The key thing here in the rule book, more uh, obviously the you know the rules are important. You got to flip, you got to read the rules, of course. But the key thing I want to draw attention to in the rule book is this examples of play. And it starts here on page eight, and it goes over a few more pages, and it goes through painstakingly an example of play of a complete um, section of the game. This is singularly, in my opinion, the best way to learn this game. Um, I, uh, you know, got the game, opened it up, read the rules, got the game out on the table and started to play it solitaire to understand the rules. Got a, you know, a couple of, like half, or maybe a full turn in and went, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Uh, so I went back to the rule book. And I went through and the examples of play and restarted the game using examples of play. Um, it is the simple best way to learn the game. And it's because the way the examples of play have been done, it makes you understand the ramifications of what is a fairly straightforward, simple rule set, but what it means from a um, wargaming point of view, from using strategies point of view. It's absolutely invaluable. And it's, um, the examples of play are, like I said, they're, um, they're paced. So you can go through each section, one section at a time, following their example. That's basically how I learned this game. Follow the, follow the example that's been written here um, and it, you will understand the depth of the game um, even though, like I said, the, the rule set is quite uh, is quite simple and quite straightforward, and beautifully done. Um, now, and as you can see, it is we're up to seven, you know sort of the seventeenth section here, and it goes on and on. And I can't recommend enough going through those examples of play. So that's the first scenario. Then they're going to they do exactly the same thing for the second scenario, which is June the fifteenth to the eighteenth. Having played both scenarios, um, I prefer this one. This is of the two. It's partly because, you know, if you're familiar with my channel, you'll know that I am a, um, a very keen enthusiast of this historical period. So for me, the this scenario from the June the fifteenth uh, to the eighteenth was um, was super compelling to me. Um, and ex and again, you get that you get this this brilliantly done um, example of play where you can just follow the examples, move the counters where the example is showing you, and it helps you understand um, the, the game. And then at the end, a brilliant two-page two page section on um, from Mark on designer notes, which is, which is absolutely fantastic, absolutely great. So the rule book, you know, we're up to page 23 now, but that's not 23 pages of rules. It's only a few pages of rules, and then what you get with these examples of play is page after page of helping you understand the depth and nuances of the game mechanics by giving you examples. And that is brilliant. And that is one of the, um, for me, one of the key uh, takeaways I've had from, from this game. So let's now have a look at some of the mechanics. Now I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through and detail every single mechanic in this game. I'm sure there'll be lots of other people on YouTube doing exactly that. Instead, what I want to talk about is some of the mechanics that I found really interesting and um, really different and that found um, very compelling as part of this part of this game. So what I've done here is I've set the game up um, to the actual um, example of play that I talked about earlier. And from memory, this is round about, I've got it 
no, wrong place. Um, this is uh, sort of the fifth section 15 on the first example of play. And what we have here is the French trying to take uh, quatre bras here from, from the English, from the British. And uh, we have the French here trying to take Ligny, um, Saint Amand from, from the Prussians. And when I've been, um, one of the interesting things for me anyway, is that this game is it's designed as a two player game. Um, I think they, GM, I think on the magazine they rate it low suitability for solitaire, and I would agree with that. What I would say is that um, I've enjoyed playing the game Solitaire primarily because I've been able to set up some examples and play them out from a sort of historical, um, I don't know, historical learning point of view, I'll call it. And I've enjoyed that Solitaire quite a lot. And because the game, as you can clearly see here, is a low counter density game, on a beautiful map um, with very straightforward mechanics I've been able to enjoy that solitaire immensely um, and it's because of those reasons. Part of that is because the mechanics are very very simple so to, to draw um, a very simple example I'm just going to move a hill there and I'm going to put um, Laval there next to each other um, they're both on the flip side to show that they're in combat and um, you both roll a dice and whoever gets the highest dice number wins. Saying that there are some modifiers you, as you would expect. So Hill has two stars so he'd, that would receive a plus two to the dice roll. So if these were actually the dice rolls Hill would get a plus two making it five over four. So Hill, Hill would have won that round of combat. Then you would refer to the one of the very few tables in the game, which is the combat results table. Because they won by a plus one, the French would retreat. Very simple. Um, if you win by a plus five, the other um, counter is eliminated or can be what's called blown, which means it's removed from play, but will, can come back into the game later on. It's very simple. However, there are then extra layers of depth to this. So if if Hill was in um, a town, there could be another bonus to that. If um, this French counter here had support from another counter um, next to it in combat, then they'd get a plus one and so forth and so forth. So these layers, of depth on top of that very simple game mechanic, which I really enjoyed. What it means is, once you've read through the rules, which will take a few minutes, you set yourself up an example. By going through the examples of play, you'll have the combat worked out for yourself incredibly quickly. And you'll understand, um, through the examples of play, how to best utilise the small amount of counters that you have in the game, in the, um, both in the how you utilise them from the combat point of view, but also how you organise them and how you position them. Positioning is also super important in this game, because you not only do you have a zone of control with the hexes around the counter, you also have what's called a zone of influence, which is the series of hexes around the um, around the zone of control hexes and this can prevent uh, enemy he uh, counters moving into or they can move into that zone of influence but then they have to stop. Positioning of your counters on the board is absolutely critical and I'll give you a quick example of that. So in this example and again this is straight away taken from the examples of play that's illustrated in the rule book and um, this for me was you know, having got the game out, set it up, put the counters out, playing it for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, I went to the examples of play. At this point, this is when I went, oh, I absolutely love this game. And, it's, and, uh, and uh, here it is. In the examples of play, a French player moves this uh, counter of, uh, of horse to um, this hex here. 
to blue triangle now, right? And what that does is they're not going to engage in combat because their zone of control is, you know, the hex is around them. But their zone of influence, which goes around that zone of control, now intersects with this road here. And would also intersect with this road here. And what that would do is it would prevent the British player, who's got some counters further away, from moving, uh, reinforcing the British into that quattro bar hex there. Um, and just simply by that positioning of that zone of influence um, had that gameplay effect. And that's a component of this game that I absolutely, I've just realised uh, well it's in the wrong place. Apologies for that. Um, but that is an example of where the positioning, just a simple example with the positioning on the board. And going through the examples of play, you will learn those types of mechanics, which I really, really enjoyed. Um, now, I keep calling them the um, the British. I should be calling them the Anglo-Allied. I do apologise <laughs> Do apologize for that. But it's just a quick example, a simple example, of a very simple mechanic that has quite a wider reaching um, gameplay implication. The other mechanic that I really want to talk about for just a few seconds is that um, one of the elements that's not completely unique to this game, but very different than a lot of games, is that <clears throat> you'll often take, in, um, when you're playing the game, you're often taking it in turns to move um, your counters, and your counters can move more than once. And that creates quite an interesting gaming experience. So often you're moving your counters, especially along the roads, um, towards your commanders, and then they become in your command range. And the command range of your counters, so for example, nay there is um, four. Um, so they can move quite long distances. And you'll move a counter, and then your opponent will move a counter, and then you'll move maybe the same counter again. And just that nature of, um, you know, the ability to move several times um, is not something you see too many times in war games, and something that helps the game pace. And the game's pace uh, is pretty fluid. Um, I think they're sort of saying in the rules, I think I read sort of an hour and a half, I don't know, something like that. And I would, broadly speaking, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I'll just check the back of 90 minutes. Yeah, so you can play through the Waterloo campaign in that um, in that amount of time. And that is, uh, for you know, for someone who doesn't, for someone like me, uh, um, who enjoys a lot of war games, and some of the war games I'm playing, you know, six, eight hours, it's not unusual. But there are some evenings where I just want to play a game in an evening and finish it, and that will do this. You can play that quite comfortably in an, in an evening, um, especially with a you know with a friend. So it has that sort of great pacing to it, I would describe. The other thing I should probably point out in terms of taking it in turns, um, once one player passes... Um, and doesn't want to move any more counters or can't, probably because they're in zones of influence or zones of control of the enemy, is that then the opposing, opposing, opposing player, depending on how many counters they have on the board, depending on if they're in, in uh, zones of control, enemy zones of control, will then uh, determine how many more sort of activations of movement they can make. So it's got an element of unpredictableness to the turn structure, which uh, you know I, uh, which I did very much enjoy as well. So I just checked the rule book, and uh, there's a better diagram of the zone of influence and zone of control than I've probably poorly explained. Um, but it does highlight this really super interesting mechanic of um, there's your zone of control, there's your zone of influence, and they both have different um, game gameplay impact and um, what you will learn by playing through the game is how to how they can be utilized best utilized to prevent movement from the opposing player so some quick wrap-up thoughts um, component quality is is great I cannot um, express my love of the map art enough a very clear counters, um, the usual quality you'd expect, um, 
a very well written rule book, very well edited, edited rule book, um, very clear, concise amount of rules. It is a low complexity game, and I would agree with that. And the reason I gave pause at the beginning of the game when I described that kind of comes into what I'm going to talk about now a little bit. The actual mechanics are very straightforward and simple. Using them to the best ability of either side is incredibly deep. And um, and I, you know, have played a few, um, both scenarios a couple of times now, and I would say I'm only scratching the surface of the depth of the use of those mechanics in this game. And it's, um, and there are more mechanics than I have described quickly. But that's where the, that's where this game comes in, is that it's a low counter game you can play in an evening for an hour and a half, you know, hour and a half, maybe the first time you play, first few times, might be more like two hours, but you can play it in the evening. There's no great amount of stacking. It's, um, it's sort of, um, you know, a very straightforward and streamlined process of going through the game turns, and you just simply go through the turn as it is described in the rule book. But utilizing those simple mechanics is, um, that is where the depth of the game is. And is this a game that I would um, put in front of someone who's never played a war game before? I'll be honest with you, it's not. It's not. Um, because they will kind of, without, you know, you need to understand how those mechanics work before you really can play with someone else, if that makes sense. So what I would say is, how I would sum this up is, I've enjoyed this game, Solitaire. It's not a Solitaire game. It's not a bot AI. There's no game engine here to play against, etc. I've enjoyed it because I enjoy playing this historical period. And as you can see from the example that I've reset up from Catroba and uh, from Ligny, I, you know, in an evening will happily, happily move those counters about and roll some dice and try and see different outcomes. And I can do that game brilliantly. So from that point of view, for me, as, a, as an historical enthusiast, it is great. And I can enjoy that solitaire brilliantly. Perfect for me. Not for everyone solitaire. For playing with an opponent, two players, you need to be playing with someone who's got the same level of experience of this game as you have. So it's great to play with someone who's never played it before, if you've provided you've hardly played it at all. If you're going to play with someone who's played it like 20 times more than you have, you're going to struggle because of the, their understanding of how to best place their counters on the map. Um... You obviously still do have some element of chance because of the dice rolls for sometimes in the game turn, for sure, but not a lot, but for combat, for sure, you know. Um, an example of this, um, I, before filming this, I had a quick, uh, quick game just back up to this setup, and the French took Kratrobar in the first turn. The first turn, we set this up because they rolled a six, and the, and the, um, the, British, the British, I keep calling them the British, apologies, rolled a one. You know, so the randomness and dice roll does have some gameplay, obviously can have some gameplay impact at that polarised point. But this is a game that you're going to enjoy if you're playing with a human, with another opponent who has the same level of understanding as you of this game. And that's probably why I wouldn't recommend it for an introductory war game, even though it's low density counters, and even though the rules are straightforward because of that reason. However, as I said, I've enjoyed it solitary immensely because of my appreciation and love for this historical period. Plus, I think combined with the gorgeous map, counters, simple, straightforward uh, rule set, I would very much enjoy playing against someone else. Um, in my case, someone who, who's also, you know, just starting to learn the game, learn some of the intricacies, and we can play a game in an evening and then discuss, oh, uh, you know, that was interesting how that that played out. Maybe next time I would have done this differently and had that sort of level of conversation around the game. And for that, it's absolutely absolutely fantastic as well. So, you know, another great game uh, in this series. I hope there's going to be a lot more. Um, I hope they do see it. I hope there's a deluxe version. I'll definitely buy it as well. Um, I bought this copy from Second Chance Games here in the UK. 
obviously you get the magazine as well so that's that's you know that's great and there's a lot of interesting articles in there that i'm going to be looking forward to reading but i just thought i'd give you my initial impressions initial thoughts and my quick review of what i have enjoyed about this game and what i can see the potential of this game is so uh, again thanks for watching as always